So I'm Colin Jones uh, at TRPT Tropic Colin on Twitter. It's unpronounceable, sorry. Uh, I'm the CTO at Eighth Light, which is a software consulting and custom development shop. Um, and one of our core principles as a company is about learning and improving in our craft. So it's great to be here at RubyConf among a bunch of all of you who, who are clearly by coming to a conference motivated to, to get better at what you do. So it's great to be here. And we as a company and I as an individual have historically focused uh, sort of more on applications development, so web, mobile, desktop, um, back-end sort of service -y sort of stuff. But over the past couple of years, I've gotten more and more interested in the systems side of things, the systems level of the, the actual full stack, um, and in particular on performance. So like things like, how do I make this system go faster? Why are these things so, so horrifically slow? Um, what, what can we improve? And I've noticed over that time that I've had enough wrong ideas and intuitions about performance that uh, those wrong ideas have sort of added up and made it very hard for me to trust my own intuition um, when, I, when I do run into a performance issue. And so I find it to be pretty unsatisfying when I or, or somebody like me um, sees a slow application and instantly jumps, jumps to solutions, right? Solutions like rewrite in your favorite language, right? Change from Ruby to Go. Um, use a different database, switch from Postgres to Mongo, whatever. Um, write, write a bunch of caching logic, who knows? The list can go on, I'm sure you can imagine your own. Um, I, I've just seen too many times um, where it, you know, it takes a while to write this new solution, and hopefully it does the job, hopefully it solves the problem, um, but whether it does or not, you've invested that time, and it's definitely gonna uncover new problems to be solved, right, after that rewrite or that big change, that big solution's been implemented. And so, based on observing these tendencies in myself over time and reflecting on them, I'm investing more time these days on the other side of this, this sort of cycle, uh, in, in understanding problems more fully, um, really grasping all, all of the pieces um, that, are, that are causing the issues before I start to think about solving them, or at least that's, that's what I'm attempting to do. And so in this talk, I'm gonna share a bit about why, a lot about how um, I've been trying to understand performance problems in particular better. Um, so I'm sure it's no surprise, since it's part of the talk title, that we're gonna explore how to get insight into problems by using Dtrace. Um, but first, let's talk about what Dtrace actually is. Um, so Dtrace is a, a dynamic tracing and observability system. So that's a fancy way of saying that it lets you see in depth what's going on in your computer at any given time. Um, it's from the Solaris Illumos world. Um, it's also on FreeBSD, Oracle's Linux, um, and it also does ship and work with OS X. There's some caveats if you wanna, or Mac OS now, I guess. Uh, th there's some caveats as of El Capitan. If you wanna start using it, there's, there's gonna be some hoops you have to jump through, and I'll, I'll have a link at the end to show you what those hoops are. Um, but you, you can run it on, OS X, on, on Macs, and, and that's, that's the sort of angle that I've taken with Dtrace. So all these, all these things you're gonna see are in the context of me just running locally on my develop machine, del development machine. It was built for production, but you know, this is the context I'm, I'm operating in. Okay, so Dtrace, if you're familiar with strace on Linux, um, it can be convenient to think about Dtrace as a, basically a fancier version of strace. Um, if you're not familiar with strace, no big deal. Um, strace basically lets you spy on system calls that are going on um, in any given process. Um, so at a higher level than that, anytime your application code asks the operating system to do something, whether that's open a file or read or write from the network, um, strace knows about that happening and can let you know. Um, Julia Evans, incidentally, wrote a terrific zine on strace that I'd recommend everybody check out whether you're familiar with strace or not. It's great stuff. Okay, so dtrace lets you spy on system calls as well. Um, in fact, this is a pretty common workflow, especially as you're, you're first starting to investigate some issue. Okay, but I said fancier, and so what is, what is the plus plus uh, part? So dtrace lets you write programs to trace events. Um, in this initial case, those events are all system calls, um, and, but those programs can let you filter, aggregate, and take other actions based on what events are being traced. The programming language that you use um, to, to do this filtering, aggregation, and other actions um, is pretty limited. It's, it's a bit of a weird programming language. D, D is the programming language. It's not the same D that's like the successor to C or C++. It's a, it's a whole different thing. But it's a very limited language, and, and that's by design. Your programs that you're writing to trace these events are running in the kernel. So kernel, very you know, heavily protected area of the operating system, very, you know, has permission to do you know, essentially anything. Um, but Dtrace is designed to be safe to run on production systems, right? So this is, it's built for production, it's built to be safe for production, and therefore by limiting the programming language, um, the Dtrace implementers have, have the opportunity to prevent you from doing things that, that 
might go bad. For, for instance, um, there's no loops in this language, um, which to me, like, when I discovered this, I was like, well, this, isn't, this is crazy. How can I get anything done with, without loops? Um, but so there, there's some convenience that you trade off, but this way Dtrace has an easy time of ensuring that you don't have like an infinite loop, for example. Um, so your program's actually gonna halt, so. Um, but it's safe is the idea. Okay, so what does running Dtrace actually look like in, in practice? What does it look like? So you can you know, fire up a terminal, run Dtrace from your terminal, and give it your program as input. This is, this is just me typing, typing a program essentially on, on a command line. Um, you, can, you can put the program in a file, of course, for more, for more complicated programs. You may even do it for a program as short as this. If you've done any awk or seen any awk, it, it, you might see some similarities here. It's heavily inspired by awk. So this program traces two different kinds of events. Um, system call entries, syscall, colon, 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 entry, and the dtrace system ending. So basically when you, you trace for a while and you hit control C, boom, that's the dtrace end event will fire. Um, so the colons here s indicate a few levels of namespacing, uh, essentially, and then inside the curly braces is the processing action that's gonna happen when that event fires. Okay, um, and, and in this example, we're aggregating all the system calls across the machine. So this is system-wide, not even just the system calls made by any given pro by a specific process, but by any process, which is kind of cool. Um, and in, uh, we are aggregating all the system calls um, and then aggregating them uh, sort of by two, two, two keys, and one is the, the probe func, which is the name of the syscall, and then the exact name is the name of the program that called it. And then when the program ends, it truncates the aggregation to the top 10 and prints it out. Okay, so uh, I, I, I don't expect you're gonna come out of this call, uh, out of this, uh, th this, this talk, knowing everything about Dtrace and just being able to like hammer out programs, but this, this is hopefully gonna give you a, a good enough idea of what's going on that you can, you can um, know where to go. Okay, so that, that, that's the idea. And then when we run it and we hit Control C to end it, end the trace, it looks something like this. And as you can see, Slack shows up a lot here. It's probably spending a lot of time rendering animated GIFs. Um, actually, I remember when I ran this and that's exactly what it was doing, it was a bunch, bunch of animated GIF rendering, uh, which is great. Um, and the, these, these uh, syscall names over here on the left might be a little opaque to you, and they certainly were for me. I didn't, you know, even after digging into Dtrace for a while, I didn't know what, like, half of these things were, and so I looked at the man pages because I was interested in seeing, seeing what they did. Um, you could Google them, et cetera. And this is gonna be a sort of a theme throughout the talk that you don't have to know everything about systems to get value out of tools like this. You can use it as a learning tool. Okay, so, uh, stepping back up, actually a little further down um, from, from the system call sort of application to operating system boundary, uh, you can actually look at lower level resources, so things that are further down downstream. Um, and so system resources like the disk or the memory system, you can actually trace events on those. So an example here is um, we can see how many page faults requiring I.O. are happening, so that gives us some idea of what memory usage is like and what processes are actually um, causing these page faults to happen. Um, so in, in this case, if we run the trace, Google Chrome and MDS stores are the two programs, the two exact names that are triggering the most page faults. And we can aggregate in different ways and drill in further um, into these things to investigate more. Okay, and then going back in the other direction, away from this, uh, back, back towards our application land where we're, or I'm happier, uh, you can add your own probes. Um, so developers have already, um, and, and probes are essentially like names for events that are gonna fire when they happen. Um, and developers have already done these for some widely used applications and dynamic runtimes. So like Postgres has probes built in, my SQL does, Java, Erlang, and of course Ruby ha has these built in as well. Um, and so uh, th there's also libraries out there for, for Ruby and other languages that allow you to, to write your own probes yourself and, and do even more sort of domain specific events um, and, and trace those uh, without even having to drop to like the C level or anything like that. So think about this sort of statically defined tracing, these user defined probes as almost like adding log statements, um, except for that you've kind of got a log aggregation and search system um, like the elk stack or something like that, all set up and ready for applic every application on your system in Dtrace. So that's pretty cool. I mean, there's not the persistence, it's not a perfect metaphor, but logging is a decent way to think about it. Okay, so in, an example here, uh, you can trace things that make sense, as I said, for any f f application or language runtime. Um, here I'm tracing all the events whose provider, which is that first piece, um, starts with MySQL. Um, so, uh, and, and we do similar truncation and printing as, uh, as before. 
So the MySQL developers wrote some code in, in the MySQL application that lets Dtrace see these sort of internal events that happen when I run a few simple queries. So things like query execution, parsing, um, the select statement starting and completing, and then reading and writing from the network, right? More, these more domain specific things uh, can be interesting to trace. Okay, and here's where things get really cool and almost break, mind breaking for me anyway. Uh, so you can trace arbitrary functions, so even in the kernel. So uh, without the original developers of an application writing any tracing code at all. So dtrace can dynamically instrument the running code. And by that I mean, like literally, you can be running your application, uh, there's zero performance cost from dtrace, you essentially flip a switch, spin dtrace up, and dynamically insert instrumentation to running code on the fly in the already running process. And, and this is possible because dtrace is running in the kernel and it's able to sort of manipulate stuff as it sees fit. Um, so th this is really sort of magic stuff and it's, it's a, a thing that sets dtrace apart from many other um, sort of systems of observability tools. The D in dtrace incidentally is, is for dynamic, it's for this sort of magic dynamic tracing bit. Okay, so here's an example of that. This code uh, traces and times every kernel function that's being called while the, while the dtrace is running. Um, so there's two probes here. There's any kernel function being entered and any kernel function having, uh, being returned. So the first one sets this thread local variable, this self arrow in, and the second one checks to make sure that thing's present um, with a, a pattern match. It looks sort of like a regex there. Um, it's, it's a guard statement. You're, you're able to filter events by pattern. And the idea there is that um, if, if the return event fires first, like if you happen to, to be, start your trace and a return fires first, you don't end up with like these weird uh, numbers. So we make sure that, that uh, the function has been entered um, and then we, we check when it's returned and see how long the duration was and aggregate those durations up. Okay, and we aggregate here with this quantize function, which is, is a bit of a cool thing where it lets you see a frequency distribution of how long each of these things took. Um, and so th this kind of blows my mind. We can actually look at how many nanoseconds different kernel functions take to run. And here's just an aggregation, but with any of these, we could drill in and see what kernel function is taking the longest to run. And if we're interested, we could even like download the kernel code. I mean, the, the Mac OS X kernel code is, is available to download online. The, the Mac ecosystem isn't completely open source, but the kernel is, um, which is pretty cool. Okay, um, it, it gets even wackier in that you can not only trace function entry and exit, but also all the way down to the instruction level. So like, you know, two or three in assembly instructions down, however many bytes offset from the start of the function, and you can, you can trace that event happening. And so personally, as an application developer, I, I don't have a lot of use for that, but I can imagine that if you're further down and you're reading and writing a lot of assembly language, this could be really cool to look at. Okay, so Dtrace gives you a lot of ways to get insight into what's going on under the hood. So what does it look like actually in practice to investigate performance problems using it? I think all of us have probably had experiences where code ran uh, way slower than we think it should and, and we just didn't understand why the thing's slow and we, it, it's upsetting and it's frustrating, honestly. Um, Jeff Hodges has this great quote in this article where he says, it's slow is the hardest problem you'll ever debug. Um, and it, I think it's, it's, it's a really, really good point. His, his scope he's talking about is broader. He's talking about distributed systems, so there's a lot, a lot more going on, but this stuff's not easy even on one machine, I think. Um, so, Okay, so we're gonna look at an issue uh, for the rest of the talk that happened to me in real life, but at the time I didn't know how to use Dtrace at all, so the solution was, w would be just terrible, it would be like, you know, uh, me just stumbling around in the dark if you were to watch that. So we're gonna look at an idealized version of, of, of a way you could investigate performance problems with Dtrace. Okay, so here's the deal. My team has some tests that are intermittently really, really slow, like 30 seconds. Uh, we, expect, we expect them to be milliseconds, maybe even less, um, computers are, should be fast. They should be really, really fast, not 30 seconds to, to execute a single test. And, and we don't know what's going on. It's not clear what's going on. What, what is going on? What, what is it doing? We rely on fast feedback from our tests so that we can make sure we knock out bugs before they get shipped to production so that we can ensure that, uh, you know, we fix them quickly before, you know, and, and we don't have to, like, wait two hours for feedback, right? Um, okay. We know that it's not just one test that's affected, it's not just one person that's affected. Um, we know that there seem, you know, anecdotally to be a few people who have it worse than others, but we're not really sure. It's not clear if it's the features they're working on, it's not clear if those people are just more vocal about the problem. Um, we think it might be worst in, in, uh, in, in one, you know, one part of the team, but we're not, we're not really sure. 
Okay, so anyway, th this test suite is taking way, way too long. It's making us demoralize many minutes running for just trivial changes, um, and, and, and we, we rely on fast feedback. Okay, so let's make a quick mental note, um, and even feel free to, to yell some out of, of some ideas. Like what, what could be going on here? What are some hypotheses? What things could we, could we check for? What are some things that could cause uh, really, really slow, like 30 second level wait times? Database lock? Is that the same thing? Cool. Uh, running out of memory? Running out of memory? Great, yeah. And just yell them out. No, no need for, for me to acknowledge. N plus one query? Great. Sorry, two at the same time. Maybe I, I may have a bad idea. Let's Network calls? Cosmic rays. Cosmic rays, excellent. <laughs> Cache mess, right, yep. Slow disk I.O., connection pool timeouts. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can enumerate lots of the garbage collection, um, you know, co the cosmic ray thing. Like, it could be somebody that wrote a sleep that happens to fire randomly every Tuesday and Thursday on the hour. Who knows, right? Th there are a bunch of things that could be going wrong that, that, that could cause really slow um, programs. But we don't have enough information yet to do much more than hypothesize. And here's where I'm tr sort of trying to make that shift from immediately jumping to let's implement some solutions to, like, Using, using some other methodology to understand the problem better. And you can probably guess that that methodology, based on the context clues here in this talk, um, the next step is going to be to use dtrace to gather more data and to understand the problem more fully. And, you know, that data we gather is either going to support or detract from our hypothesis, hopefully, um, but either way it can generate new ideas. Um, we, can, we can generate new ideas based on what we learn. But we could start with a hypothesis and see where it leads us. It's not, it's not the worst idea in the world. Um, because, because we have the tools to, to look at. Okay, so what are the usual suspects? For, for me, you know, this is a Rails app, and for whatever reason, my go-to, you know, I know what the problem is sort of thing, is I, I think it's either gonna be the database or I think it's gonna be slow garbage collection. Either, both in Ruby and the JVM, I always think it's gonna be one of those two things. That's my, that's my instinct, that's my gut reaction. And a lot of times that would be right. So let's, let's test that idea. Um, we, let's start with garbage collection. Uh, we can calculate the duration between garbage collection begin and end events. Here, we're using the Ruby static tracing um, affordances to, to check when the garbage collection mark um, begin and end phases um, occur, and then, you know, aggregating on, or actually not aggregating, but just printing out the duration every time it happens. We can do the same thing for the sweep phase. In fact, the, you, in the output, you'll see the, same, the exact same thing is, is going on in the sweep phase. So this is not the only way to learn about how garbage collection works. Um, we could add Ruby code to do it, and there are, there are a lot of other tools, but this works. Okay, and uh, with the code here, there's not a ton super interesting and new, except that um, since we're dealing with nanoseconds, we divide by a million to get our nice sort of human-readable millisecond level or Colin readable at any rate. Um, okay, so, and, and here's the result. The problem definitely uh, surfaced here. The 30 second pause definitely did happen, so I'm not gonna try and trick you with any of these traces we see from here on out. You can assume that every time I show you a trace, the 30 second pause, the problem did actually occur. Um, but the slowest GC uh, pauses that we saw, or the slowest GC phase execution runs, uh, were like on the order of tens of milliseconds. 38 milliseconds, I think, is the, is the, the biggest, no, there was a 71 millisecond one there. Uh, but still, tens of milliseconds, nowhere near the 30 second culprit we're looking for. Um, so, this is, this is sort of uh, an interesting thing. Let's, let's back up for a minute and think about, think about this problem at a higher level. When, when something is slow, it, it often means that some resource is limited. Um, in, in fact, it, it may al always mean that some resource is limited, whether it's hardware or software, but I'm not prepared to make that argument for you today. Uh, but it, 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 resource limitation is an, is an interesting way to think about performance issues. Brendan Gregg, uh, uh, terrific um, performance analyst, um, he, has, he has this thing called the use method, utilization, satur saturation, and errors, that um, elaborates on, on you know, what resource limitation means and some other stuff. Uh, which I would def definitely recommend checking out. But, you know, it could be a software resource like a lock or a connection pool. It could be a hardware resource like CPU or memory or something else. So let's, let's back up and think about resources. Think about this problem in terms of resources. Figure out what resources are limited. Um, so let's start at the system level. What system resources might be having issues? So here are a few system resources. This isn't all of them, but these are, th these are some that we could take a look at. 
And we could do that with Dtrace. So CPU is a pretty important resource. We can sample the on-CPU processes 997 times a second and aggregate the counts of those, um, th th those executable names that were, were caught, in, in essence, on CPU. Um, aggregate the counts of those things, like how often they happen. Um, and it, it turns out that we, we find that a program called kernel task, way down here at the bottom, um, is by far the most often on CPU. Um, kernel task, we might not know what it means, we probably can surmise that it has something to do with the kernel. Um, we could drill, drill in more and figure out what that program's doing um, by grabbing kernel stack traces wherever the kernel task program is the one that's on CPU. You can also grab user land stack traces, um, there's some caveats that we don't really have time to get into right now about around symbol resolution and compiler flags, um, but you, ca you can also get you know user space uh, stack traces. So if we're looking at kernel stack traces here, and if we drill in and see uh, see what they are, we see that it's pretty much all idle. We've got this at the very bottom. Uh, machine idle is the name of the kernel function that's being called, um, and we can we can you know, pretty much guess based on the, the good naming here that, it, you know, nothing's going on. The CPU is not burning. This, this is just the, the, the stack that's on CPU when nothing's going on on CPU. And if we bounce back up to the full list of programs that were on CPU, um, our Ruby process actually only ends up three times on CPU in all the time we were tracing. Um, so there's really not much going on CPU-wise here. And to me, this, you know, this sort of discovery feels a bit like a letdown. Um, or, or it might feel like a bit of a letdown, but it's not. I, I want to I shift everybody's head. If you're thinking it, this, is, this is a bummer that we haven't found the issue, this is not a bummer. This is an awesome discovery because now we can rule out any hypothesis that has anything to do with Ruby being on CPU. So this is like tight loops, infinite loops sort of stuff. This is too many threads competing for CPU. This is garbage collection. And you know, with any of those things, if it's not obvious to you that those things are CPU intensive, you could write some test programs and see how they behave um, to, to guarantee it. But th those are all CPU intensive when we've just ruled all of those out in addition to more. Um, and it's even better than that. It's even better than ruling out Ruby being on CPU. This rules out anything CPU intensive. This, this is like database result set sorting. This is anything at all out of process that would use CPU heavily. So I think, you know, sort of meta lesson here is that starting early with these broader resource questions is a good strategy. It feels a little bit similar to a binary search right, where you, you have this whole wide search space and you want to trim out as many options at a time as possible. If you investigate closer to log n of the possible performance issues, you're going to be a lot happier than you if you have to investigate all n of them. Okay, and so we can rule out memory and disk slowness with other Dtrace scripts, so th those aren't the issue. Um, so that rules out tons of possibilities. So maybe we take a look at networking next. We know that we definitely do lots of calls to the database, like any, any good Rails app. Um, we know that... Uh, yeah, n networking is a thing that happens a lot in our app. Um, and and if, if none of these pan out, we could, we could investigate more system resources or we could go over to the software side. Um, so let's start, let's start with networking. Let, let's trace all the socket connects and see what's slow. Um, so th there's no code on this slide, there's just a URL. Um, it, and, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, uh, it, it would take me a long time to write something like the thing that's in the script. It would take, take me a while to get in there, but th what's in the script works. It works well and it uses syscall tracing to give you socket connection latency. And I, sh I show you this because I, I want to emphasize you don't have to write everything yourself. Right? You don't have to be a systems wizard or even invest a ton of time in Dtrace to get a lot of use out of the tools um, that it provides. A lot of scripts come with, with your operating system and others you can pull down from GitHub and elsewhere. Okay, and so the result when we run this, uh, we see that our database connections to 127.0.0.1 are pretty fast. Um, the, uh, the longer latencies we do see are like 20 to 40 milliseconds, which is longer, but it's not like there's thousands of these. And I see that I've got some typos here where I have the wrong executable name process. Um, but uh, on the other hand, it is interesting that we've got uh, these connections to this external host, the 72524119. Um, I don't recognize that IP address. I expected only local connections to my local database. Um, that IP address, we could grep around our, our code and our configuration files. We find that it's not anywhere. It doesn't appear anywhere in the code base. So it makes us sort of like wonder, what, what is this IP? What is this host? Okay, um, so 
you know, in order to figure out what, what host name and IP maps to, we can do something like reverse DNS lookups, um, which aren't always reliable as we found out. You, you, this didn't end up mapping back to anything that was in our code base either. Um, but uh, DNS lookups are typically over UDP. We could um, see if there are DNS queries that might map, end up mapping back to this IP. So it's essentially like running, running the process backwards to, to trace back from where we, where we end up. Um, so DNS lookups are over UDP, and after digging a while into UDP tracing, I got a little overwhelmed, um, and because uh, there's a lot of UDP stuff going on on my machine at any given time, there's some as asynchronicity things happening. Um, but after doing a little more study and thought, I, I learned that most DNS calls go through uh, this C library function called git adder info. And so we can use that fact to use dynamic tracing and figure out you know, what, what, what hosts are being looked up and how long they take. Um, so we can dynamically trace this git adder info um, for the, the, the process ID that we're, we're interested in, grab the timestamp and the host, there's a bit of a dance and, and this copy in stir is about copying a pointer from user space to kernel space and so that it can persist through the calls. It, it, it's a whole thing. If you want to write a bunch of scripts, you'll have to, you'll have to learn a bit about it. But um, don't worry about the details here. But then at the end, you print the duration and the host name when the call returns. Okay, and then when we run it, sure enough, we find this someplace.com URL is getting looked up. Um, and even better, we find that it takes around 30 seconds to resolve. And if we do the DNS lookup ourselves, we can, we can see that that does map, in fact, back to the IP address that seemed to be um, seem to be the external one. So uh, it takes 30 seconds to resolve. So not only is this a solution to our why are we making external connections request, it's a solution to our entire problem. Incidentally, the someplace.com, it's not just me making up a fake URL for the talk. This is actually literally the URL, the domain that was in our code base. Um, it, it was in the test code. It was not in production code. Don't worry. This it is it all completely isolated to tests. So, but but this, is the, uh, this is the underlying issue. This is the whole thing. This is the game over. The people getting the slow tests are getting slow DNS lookups for this host. You know, and, and we could drill in further and you know, learn more about networking, but we know what to fix now. We have the slow DNS lookup for this particular host. So we can complain to our ISP, we can switch DNS providers, we can replace the someplace.com references with example.com, which is always fast, um, or, or we can do what any, any reasonable uh, person would do and fake out the network calls and tests and just make sure we never connect to external URLs and guarantee that across the system. Um, but and, and it feels really good. Like now we fully understand the issue. If it's super, like I don't know, freeing to to, to have this ability to go from this very specific, um, you know, this I, sorry from this vague idea like the tests are slow. The tests are really slow sometimes. Um, to this very specific DNS lookups for someplace.com are slow, and they're intermittent due to people being in multiple locations, flaky Wi-Fi, DNS caching stuff. Um, but and, you know, it feels really, really empowering to, to have, have made this jump down to the details. Okay, so let's take a step back here and review. What did, what did we learn here in this process? So one answer is we learned not to do these two specific things, and it's absolutely true, right? Uh, don't connect to external services in the test suite, and two, don't have a bad DNS situation. Make sure your DNS is fast, right? Th those, those are absolutely correct, that, and that turned out to be the solution to our problem. Um, so those are correct, sure, but on the other hand, if we you know, look for that specific problem or problems in, the, in that space every time something's slow, we're only going to be efficient in solving performance issues if those are the only problems that we run into. And for better or worse, you know, we've got, as devs, and certainly my intuition tells me to focus on whatever happened the most recently and, or, or whatever just sticks out in my head the most based on a blog post I read or what have you. And so those are the problems that, I, that I'm able to come up with solutions for, you know, very quickly. But I think the bigger, better takeaway here is that by doing performance investigations in a more disciplined and principled way, we can make ourselves more efficient in solving any problem, not just the ones that, that come to mind or happen recently. Okay, so Dtrace is absolutely not the only tool we could have used to track this problem down, but it's versatile. There are many paths. Um, Dtrace gives us the ability to ask really broad questions, like what's using CPU, or really, really focused ones, like how long does this specific low-level C function take to run? And Dtrace is programmable, so it means we can use it to build our own custom systems tools. Um, most of these scripts I wrote for this investigation, but of course now I can just copy them into my bin directory and reuse them again on future investigations to answer, answer that same question if it occurs again in, in, in the sort of binary search, or it's not really a binary search, but some sort of search space. 
And I want to encourage you that it doesn't take years of study to get great use out of Dtracer tools like it. You can get started with a few one-liners like the ones I've, I've shown here or the ones on, on the website so I'm going to link to you later. Um, but you can get a lot, you can get pretty far with, with, with just some thought about what questions you want to ask um, and you can get a lot of insight. Um, learning about how systems work at a, at a lower level than you need day to day can be really helpful for avoiding problems down the road and of course obviously when you're in crisis mode trying to solve issues. Okay, so where do you go, what do you do next if you're interested in learning more? Um, well first I would definitely recommend uh, reading the free online resources. Uh, Brendan Gregg's blog in particular is a gold mine. Um, just everything he writes, not, not just the Dtrace stuff. Um, and the Dtrace guide right below is, is really you know, thorough and I, I think it's pretty well maintained. It is focused on a Lumos, so if you're using it like me from a Mac perspective, um, then there may be some things that don't work or some things that you have to sort of like infer differences. Um, there's also a really good print book available that does have some OS, OS 10, OS X, I don't know, um, uh, uh, sections available. Um, and if you're like me and just really like having print books or if you get through the examples above, that I would definitely recommend the print book. Okay, and then of course as a, as a developer, I always learn a lot by reading other people's code. So it was really helpful for me to sort of dig around in the scripts that, that other people have written um, and, and see how they work, tweak things, see how, see how things break or, or change in their output. Um, a lot of these are, are totally approachable. They're literally like a bunch of files in your user bin directory um, that they're like literally like one line of code and a bunch of comments. Um, so, so it's kind of cool to dig into those. Uh, uh, there's a bit of a caveat here in, in looking at uh, Dtrace examples that people have up on the internet or, or, um, or on your system is that depending on how any given script is written, it may be directly useful to you or it may be out of date and it may just, it may just not work. And that's, that's sort of a fundamental issue, right? Dtrace gives you this enormous power to trace arbitrary functions even down to the instruction level. So if there's a script that you're looking at that does some of this dynamic tracing stuff and let's say, you know, the, the function that it's dynamically tracing is, is removed or renamed or changes, you know, semantic, you know, changes the way it's called in, 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 uh, uh, in the next version, then, then your script is going to break or it's, or it's, it's not going to work as you expect. Um, and it, th this is sort of a fun, fundamental issue, but there are sort of more stable um, dtrace probes that, that you can count on working from one version to the next as well. And as you get into it, you'll learn more. So I think it's also worth extrapolating in two directions here, like using Dtrace for other things besides, besides perf investigations, and also using other things besides Dtrace. Um, so for the first one, I've, I've personally used Dtrace way more, like as I said, like I'm using it on my laptop. I've used it way, way more for just general like learning about how my computer is working um, than, than for performance investigations. Um, but it's taught me a lot in that respect, and it's you know, taught me stuff that I can, I can apply to future issues. And then secondly, if you're on an OS that doesn't have official Dtrace support, see what other tools you've got available to you to get your questions answered. Um, and of course, like many of us, uh, deploy to Linux. And on Linux, there is um, a Dtrace version for Linux. It's not sort of an official thing unless you're on the Oracle one. Uh, but there's, uh, there's also System Tap, which is trying to solve similar problems. And there are some really exciting things with the latest Linux releases that if you see Brendan Gregg's blog, you'll, you'll know what I mean. Um, there's some really exciting things coming out. Um, in, in uh, Berkeley packet filters um, in like four nine kernels. Um, so that's, that's really cool stuff as well. Uh, the IO Visor GitHub organization is where a lot of that lives. So, you know, Dtrace has taught me a lot about performance operating systems and problem solving in general, and I hope it helps you too. Um, here are a few resources to check out. Um, these slides uh, will be on speaker deck and I'll tweet when they're, when they're online. So if you follow me on Twitter, you can get notified when they're up. Um, and I'd love to take any questions you have. Um, looks like we've got some time left. Um, and you know, please grab me anytime also that you want to talk throughout the conference. I always love meeting new people and talking about technology. And especially come say hi if you're interested in talking more about 8th Light and how we help companies to build and maintain reliable and flexible software. Um, we're in Chicago, London, LA, New York, and we'd love to talk. Um, so thank you very much. And I've got a little time for questions. Right, integrating something like Dtrace into the testing framework. Yeah, I can imagine, I can imagine doing so, but th I guess there, there are a few issues that would probably make me shy away from that. One is that, like typically the, the Dtrace program that you're running is external, so it's almost like you'd have to shell out and then run it. And it's, like it also needs 
root permission, so you'd have to like shell out and sudo out, which means your test suite would have to be running as root, which I, I probably wouldn't wouldn't advise. But it's definitely, um, I, yeah, I, I can imagine that sort of thing being useful. Like maybe you want to say no, there should be no DNS calls ever made, period, and you you want to run that trace. The orchestration would be tr would be tricky, right? Because you have to spin up two processes now, like one your dtrace thing, and then the other the test suite. Um, Learning about which syscalls are relevant. Yeah, so I mean, my approach so far has been to, uh, to essentially uh, spy on all of them. There's, there's this program um, that's built in, Dtrust, that's based on Dtrace, that gives you a picture of like all the system calls that are being made. So if you're, if, like what, what I've done so far has just been to kind of like, you know, uh, dig into, you know, run a trace against a program that I'm interested in, in how it's doing what it's doing, see what syscalls are being made, and then just look at the man pages, which are pretty, you know, pretty extensive um, for each syscall. Yeah, so that's, that's most of it. And Dtrust will also, like, do, for like file opens, it'll, it'll uh, I believe, I believe it'll give you the, the name of the file that comes out. Um, if it's not, it might be another program besides Dtrust. So yeah, a lot of it's just been like observing what's happening on like, workloads that I understand, that I've like made some small program to, to do a thing, um, and then make sure I understand uh, the stuff that I want to understand on the other end when the output comes out, when the full output comes out. Yeah, man to name of the syscall. So you, the man command gives you like the option of passing two arguments in this, in this uh, the first argument is like the section of the man pages and two is the syscalls section. Okay, I'd, I'd be happy to take questions or, or talk, as I said, talk with any of you afterwards up here. So thanks, thanks a lot for coming and I appreciate it.